Welcome to HortTube. My name is John Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. You can ask gardening questions down below this video in the comment section, and I pick from those each week. I usually pick 20 to 25, something like that. You guys ask way more than that, and I appreciate all the participation because without you, there isn't a question and answer video. Uh, the Learn to Garden video series should have a ground cover video up on it by the time you're watching this. And I send out an email alert to folks who own the Learn to Garden video series. Uh, there's a discount code down below this video if you're interested. Uh, videos this week, you should see a video from Linda Vodder's Beautiful Garden, which I'm actually filming in uh, this Q&A and as well over in Oklahoma City. Uh, the ground cover video uh, on the regular channel as well with just 10 uh, kind of industrial ground cover plants that you can use. The video over the Learn to Garden video series is more about using them, using ground covers in general uh, in your garden. And then there's a before and after photo video. Those of you who have sent in your beautiful before and after photos from your gardens, I really, really appreciate that. Um, it just amazes me uh, how far you guys have come in your gardens. Uh, and I still probably have about 150 emails. So if you haven't seen your garden yet, it's not on purpose. There's just so many uh, that you guys have sent. Uh, so thank you very much. So let's get into some questions from this past week's. Uh, I put up two Q and A's last week. So these are actually the questions from the first one. Uh, I may end up doing a second video at some point with the questions from the second one as well. So again, thanks for your participation. Somebody asked if I planned on doing raised beds in my vegetable garden to fight the rabbit issue that I have. No, I actually have a deer net uh, it's a seven foot tall deer net. Um, I have it linked in my Amazon links down below this video if you're interested. It's just doubled over. It's a seven foot tall uh, deer fence, plastic deer fence, uh, but it's doubled over. So it's only three and a half feet tall and it runs the uh, width around the vegetable garden. And it does a great job of keeping the rabbits out of that particular area uh, of the garden. And I'll probably just continue to use it in the future. It's been so effective and you really can't see it. You know, it's a plastic, a uh, grid net. Uh, you, you, obviously, if you're very close to it, you can see it, but once you get any distance from it, it really is kind of invisible in the garden. And so I've had that, gosh, I've had that thing longer than this channel. So more than six years, uh, I bought that roll. It was a hundred foot long, seven foot tall plastic net. I think I paid like $35 for it at the t time. So, you know, with inflation in the last few years, that's $900 maybe now. <laughs> Just joking, but it's, I'm sure it's more than, it's obviously more than 35, but it was worth the investment if you have deer or rabbit issues. Um, um, works well. Uh, let's see. So somebody said, will plain mulch prevent weed and grass seed from sprouting without using cardboard? Because I talked about using uh, you know, I get all kinds of questions about, you know, to use cardboard to start the beds. And I said last week in last week's video, if you, if you like that technique, do it. It does slow down a bit the process of the mulch, you know, breaking down and improving your soil and that kind of thing. But it's such a temporary thing. It doesn't really matter all that much, you know, but I was pointing out that it is, there is a delay when you put a barrier between your mulch and the soil, uh, even though that barrier breaks down you know, that it starts actually improving soil. But no, no, plain mulch is definitely not gonna prevent weeds and, you know, weed seeds and that kind of thing from the soil beneath it as much as uh, cardboard or some sort of newspaper or something like that. Um, but, you know, my mulch control is that, I, you know, my control of weed seeds in our garden is, well, number one, you can't control them completely. You're gonna have weeds. Uh, but I, I do mulch twice a year, and I've talked about that a lot, once in the spring and once in the fall. And, you know, I try to do it just before those seed, weed seeds would be germinating. So as the soil temperature comes up to about 65 degrees in the spring, that's where you get a lot of your summer weeds germinating. Even if you don't see them for a long time, because they'll just sit there as little seedlings and root in for a month or two. And then in the heat of the summer, just go, you know, crabgrass you know, all those kinds of things grow really quickly once it gets hot, but they spend a little bit of time rooting themselves in. It's the same thing with the winter weeds, henbit and chickweed and those kinds of things. They'll germinate in the fall, spend some time getting themselves ready, and then as soon as it, the soil temperature starts to warm up in February, they just take over your entire bed really quickly. I'm sure lots of you have had experience with that. So again, I'm trying to cap the soil at the right time of year, and that's somewhat helpful, but you are going to have some weeds uh, that you're going to have to work with. And regardless of how you started, the, if you started with cardboard and that slowed the weeds down, 
you're still going to get squirrels and rabbits and you know chipmunks and birds and your foot traffic and your dog's foot traffic and all those things breaking that weed barrier that you, you know, of the mulch and creating situations where you're going to have some weeds. You can reduce it over time by never, never allowing those weeds to come to seed though. So you can reduce your seed bank somewhat over the years, but you, you know, you're always going to be fighting some weeds. Somebody asked if there's a dwarf Colorado blue spruce. We actually have one uh, in our garden. You can pretty much get any uh, blue spruce for any size you want. So from, you know, two to three feet in height up to, you know, uh, 60 feet in height, you know, uh, so, so you, that's just a shopping thing, looking for the one. If you want a Colorado blue spruce that you think you can keep between four and six feet, there's definitely one uh, that's upcoming content that I'm pretty excited about, uh, about conifers. You guys are gonna see one of the most beautiful conifer gardens you've ever seen uh, coming up in the next couple of months. And so I'm really, 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 really excited about that. And I'll just hold it to that, but I'll be showing off some uh, really wild conifers that not everybody will be able to grow, uh, and including myself. Um, but I can, uh, it's one of the beauties of gardening. If, you know, we, I can't necessarily have the tropicals that I could go down to Miami and see, uh, but that's what makes Miami interesting, right? Is that I can go there and see something interesting. I can't necessarily grow some of the lilacs and things, you know, but that's the beauty of going up to Connecticut or New York or some place much colder is that I can see those things in those environments. So it's kind of neat for me to be able to go see a bunch of conifers that I can't necessarily grow them all in my hotter, humid climate in the Southeast, but that doesn't make them any less fun uh, just because I can't own them. Uh, so th th that's, co that's coming up. Okay, so um, somebody has gooseneck loose strife uh, and they want to know how to get rid of it. They've actually tried to spray it with glyph glyphosate or Roundup and it hasn't been effective. Unfortunately, the, this is the answer that I get to all of these questions. The next question is about Bermuda grass. Unfortunately, it's tenacity, and there's a chemical called tenacity. I'm not actually talking about the chemical tenacity. I'm talking about work. Uh, unfortunately, you've got to get in there and dig that stuff out. Uh, loose strife is a particularly um, uh, one that can can be a big, big, big time bully in the garden. And you know, there are some loose strifes that are actually just illegal. Uh, we had. Uh, you know, North, the state of North Carolina banned uh, um, gooseneck loose strife a long time ago. And we, you know, we had it in our garden center we had bought from out of state somewhere. And I remember the state coming in and telling us to get rid of them. Uh, it's a very, very aggressive uh, ground cover, uh, invasive, but not all, you know, there are, there are other varieties that are less, or other species that are less, less aggressive. But again, any of these questions I get about, um, you know, something's taking over, how do I get rid of it? I mean, it's either you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna spray it or you're going to get out there and, and you're gonna have to dig it out and you're gonna have to stay on top of it. You can't ever let it come back and dominate that space again. You've gotta, it's just gotta be a constant thing for sometimes it might take a year, sometimes it might take two years, sometimes it might take three years. The back garden at the house in Raleigh was uh, had liriope spicata, the spreading liriope, which is awful. Uh, there was uh, mondo grass planted back there that you would think would be much easier to kill than it's actually been. Uh, there were a lot of perennial weeds uh, that were back in that garden. And there's ivy and there was ivy up in the trees behind me, so it's continued to drop weed seed back there. But if you came to the garden right now, you wouldn't see any of those things. And it's not because, and it's just been because literally every time I've seen it, Every time I've seen it, it's gone. It's gone immediately. It's gone immediately. It can't, it can't linger. Uh, it can't get a chance to get energy from the sun and rebuild itself. Uh, otherwise, you're literally starting over every time. So it's really, again, about just staying on top of it. And then Bermuda grass was the next question. And those Bermuda grass questions are the exact same. I have a video on the channel for what is the worst weed to garden with, and I think it's Bermuda grass. Um, and so much of it's gotten planted, so many homes you know, I'm here, it, it, this is what, you know, the lawn is here at, uh, uh, you know, at Linda Vodder's garden, you know, out, out, out by the road out there. And this whole garden was, uh, you know, when she moved in here, you know, it was all Bermuda grass. So from here in Oklahoma City to the south and over to the east coast, it's all, you know, just Bermuda grass everywhere. It's, it is di very, very difficult. You have to put up actual physical barriers, you know, concrete and that kind of thing is the only way to stop it. One of the suggestions I've given people in consultations is to plant, 
your plants a little further back in the beds. So if, you, if you're just using a trench edge, you know, for your Bermuda grass, it's always gonna try to creep into the bed, of course. But giving yourself about a foot between where your beds, where your plants start uh, and the turf will give you some defendable space. So you can go back in and either, whatever your method is, I don't care, whether it's spraying it or using some sort of tool or a weed eater or pulling it or whatever the heck kind of thing you wanna do, don't let the plants creep too close to the Bermuda grass because then the Bermuda grass gets up in the plants and it's very, very difficult to control. So maybe, you know, again, just having some sort of mulch, even if you can't put in some sort of concrete barrier or stone wall or whatever, uh, you can at least do that. Leave yourself a little gap where you can take a vacation and not have the Bermuda grass be already up in your plants. Uh, so that's one suggestion, but there's just unfortunately no great way to garden with it. And I've got a couple patches of Bermuda grass at the garden in Raleigh and they're small. I should have been able to get them under control a long time ago, but they're in perennial plants that, you know, you can pull it and pull it. You'll never get it all. It's just, and, you, and I can't do anything else in those spaces because they're, it's planted spaces. Okay, so somebody has a Fiona uh, Sunrise Jasmine. They're in zone 6A. That thing's only hardy to 7A to 9B apparently. They want to know if they should spring or fall plant it. You definitely would not want to plant something in the fall that's a full zone, less cold hardy than your area. Uh, but with that said, if you had a protected space where you were going to put it in the ground and you could commit yourself to covering it on cold nights during the winter, you might be able to plant it. Uh, but I think the best thing to do would probably be able to bring it in and out. Just have it outside when it's above freezing and have it inside a garage or inside the house uh, and then try, attempt to spring plant it. But know that a plant that's a full, you're in a full zone, you know, below where this thing wants to actually live, wherever you plant it in the spring, make sure it's kind of a protected space uh, away from the winter wind um, up against that structure of your house would probably be best. Okay. It says, somebody just ask, is it possible to transplant a plant too many times? Yeah, probably. There's probably going to be one of the times you move it that you're going to do some significant root damage to it, or you're going to put it in the wrong place one time and it's going to take a major setback. Uh, no, that you could transplant something. If you could transplant it well, you could transplant it all over the yard forever and ever and ever. I just feel like at some point you're going to run into some bad luck and uh, do it on the wrong day, uh, do it on a week where it gets to 100 degrees right after you did it, or it gets super cold, or you put it in a spot that's too sunny or too dry or too shady. I feel like you're just gonna make a mistake eventually uh, if you're trying to pop something out of the ground 20 times to see where it fits. My suggestion would be, if you're trying to figure out where to put something, is to put it back in a container and then move the container around until you've decided where you'd, you'd like to put it in the ground and then uh, pop it in the ground at that point once you've made a real, once you've really committed to that being the space that it's gonna be in. That way you're not doing so much damage to it. Uh, so somebody has an untidy reblooming azalea. So let's say they have an encore azalea and it's got a few little extra branches coming up on it. Uh, they just wanna make it look neater. You can cut those wily branches off anytime you wanna cut them off. I, but, you know, this is one of my frequent things is like, if, if you have a crazy branch on something, just cut it off. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. It probably does have a few flower buds on those wily branches uh, that would have bloomed in the spring. Uh, but the vast majority of your flower buds are still going to be on the, 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 the tighter part of the plant. So if you have a couple, you have a couple, two, three branches that look unruly on the top of something, just cut them off whenever. You're not gonna cost yourself that enough flowers to be concerned about it. If you're concerned about the way the plant looks, or, um, just get it over with and get it behind you. Uh, don't worry about the time of year being the perfect day to do it or whatever, uh, just do it. I got the sun on and off of my head here, which is kind of weird probably. <laughs> we're, gonna get, we're, gonna, we're gonna plow through this though. Uh, let's see. So somebody asked if they've cut up their leaves. I talked about last week, just taking your lawnmower and cutting up your leaves that fall off your tree and then using them as mulch in the garden. They could ask if they can put it on top of their existing mulch. Yeah, absolutely. No problem at all. That's how it would happen in the woods, right? If you think about the way the forest floor is, it's going to have you know, just layers of things like that, right? You're gonna have the, 
you know, whatever sticks and uh, branches and pine cones and whatever it fell out of the trees, uh, probably dead animals and all kinds of things that fell out of the trees during the season. And then in the fall, it's going to lay down its leaves on top of it. So that, that's how the forest floor would work anyway. So don't worry. Yeah, yeah, cut, cut your leaves up, put them on top. Again, what we're trying not to do though is put 14 inches of organic material on, it, on our existing beds. You know, just put a small, put a thin layer of that material across everything. Um, and it, uh, having cut the leaves up some, they'll break down really, really quickly. Uh, and it'll, it'll, it'll lay down flat and, uh, and, and, look, and look good fine, you know, look, look better than having the leaves whole probably if you're looking for a more tidy look. And again, the more edges you put on the leaves by breaking them up, the faster they actually break down and start feeding the soil. Okay, so people talk about, uh, I get these questions all the time about dumping fertilizer into the uh, planting holes. You'll see this on a lot of, of videos. Uh, folks pouring either biotone or some sort of fertilizer down at the bottom of the hole and they were just you know, their grandmother or somebody had told them that the roots on most of these plants are up in the top three, four inches of the, two, three, four inches of the soil. Does it even do any good to dump that fertilizer down in the bottom of the hole? Probably in some cases, yes, in some cases not. But I will tell you right now, if you take a three gallon container, uh, you know, with a root ball that's, you know, 12 inches deep, something like that, and you plant it in my clay soil in Raleigh, uh, and then dig it out of the ground in, a, in two years, almost all the roots that were at the very bottom of that root ball will be gone. And what I'll have is more of a pancake roots on most woody ornamentals, not all, but most have very shallow root systems up here. So there probably is, you know, very little reason for pouring it, um, for pouring it down in the hole like that. Uh, again, if it works for you and it's something you've done and it's something you've copied from some other person that you watch or whatever, you know, my opinions are, <laughs> Or, you know, just are just that and continue to do it. But I think you'd be much better off uh, putting the plant into the ground, putting some of the soil back in, you know, maybe three, four inches of soil back in. And then if you want to then put the biotone or whatever you, you're using, you know, or in the ring around it from there, you'd probably be better off than having it so deep down in the uh, deep down in the ground where a lot of those microbes you're trying to feed aren't necessarily alive anyway. Of course, that depends on your soil type, but you know, as to the depth at which, you know, those kind of creep, you know, those kinds of beneficial bacteria and beneficial microbes could actually live. Um, but I think you'd be better off digging your hole, plant, putting the plant in, packing some soil around and then pouring it in there if that's what you were interested in. Again, I'm not fertilizing when I'm planting. I'm fertilizing in February or March with some sort of organic fertilizer once a year. And I think there, anything beyond that, you're mostly overdoing. Um, um, and, and these, the, you'll, you'll find that as long as you're doing the mulching and composting and using your leaves and all those kinds of things, you just don't need as much fertilizer as you're being told you need anyway. Somebody wants an alternative to Empress of China dogwood because they can't find them. And I realize that every single time I show that tree in Raleigh, I'm frustrating people because they can't find it. Growers have had a very difficult time with that tree. That tree gets root rot issues in a container. Uh, uh, every single time somebody thinks they've got it solved, it's just it's this difficult nursery tree. There's a lot of plants like this. There's some plants that grow really, really well in nurseries. Uh, and they sell millions. And then as I look around landscapes, I never see them. So obviously they're good nursery plants and not great ornamental plants in people's gardens. But then the opposite can also be true where you can have a really tough, great ornamental plant, but nurserymen really, really struggle. That's part of what plant trialing is all about. So when they, you know, somebody comes up with a new plant, usually it'll go through about a three year process of figuring out, can it be rooted, rooted easily? Can it be grown in a container easily? And does it transplant easily? And can a customer rely on it in the ground? Uh, all of those checklists have to be met. So new plants being introduced, more and more trialing has gotten better and better. It's a rigorous set of things. If the growers can't grow it, what's the point of having it? If homeowners can't grow it, what's the point of growing it at a nursery? Uh, and that's where we are with Empress of China Dogwood. It's just an extremely difficult plant in a nursery setting. There are people still growing it. And there, there is some availability out in the world, but I couldn't tell anybody where that is. 
you know, what Home Depot that is or what garden center that is. I have no idea uh, what growers are, you know, where they're sending, where they're sending plants. So you may still run into one, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I, I just have no idea. But you can do a regular Kusa dogwood. Uh, they're going to lose their leaves in the winter, so it's not going to be evergreen. But they do, they are longer bloomed typically than our native dogwoods, and they do get the red fruit, the edible fruit that's similar to the Empress of China dogwood. So, and there are some great, really great cultivars of Kusa dogwood. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, again, sim similar flowers, similar fruit, deciduous. Okay. Um, what plants lend themselves to being tree formed? Most upright, narrow growing shrubs, so a lot of different viburnum, like. Um, Viburnum macrocephalum, Chinese viburnum, which is in one of the Linda Vodder's videos that will probably be up after this, um, can be tree formed. So there's a lot, you know, at my, at the house right now, we've got uh, several viburnum. I've got viburnum placatum. Uh, I've got viburnum macrocephalum, uh, which is the Chinese snowball viburnum. Got viburnum nudum that I'm tree forming. That means I'm limbing them up from the bottom. Uh, of course, uh, hydrangea paniculata, as we see more and more tree forms of limelight hydrangeas, and I've got one at the house that I'm working on. Uh, so there's lots, pretty much any upright narrow shrub. So uh, Osmanthus fragrance uh, kind of doesn't matter, kind of doesn't matter. If it's kind of an upright narrow shrub, you can in all likelihood limb it up over time and create a tree look. Uh, if you're planning on having it look like a tree in the future, you may decide to buy one that has multiple trunks on it so that the trunks are more interesting. Uh, but there are lots and lots and lots of plants. And if you go back and look at the Giberson, any of the Giberson Garden uh, videos that I have, and there's a, uh, there was a video from there two weeks ago, but uh, that playlist, the Giberson Garden on the channel, uh, you can see how many things Ram has turned into trees in her garden in Athens, Georgia. It's quite surprising how many different plants can be uh, limbed up into trees. But viburnum in general, uh, as a group, uh, the larger growing viburnums almost all lend themselves to being tree formed. And there's a viburnum that everybody can grow. Okay, so somebody asked about care of bulbs before you plant them. Should you put them in the refrigerator? So you receive your bulbs earlier than you'd like to put them in the ground. Should you put them in the fridge? I would not put daffodils um, in the fridge. The ones that I might put in the fridge, if, especially in the south, would be tulips uh, and hyacinths. But everything else, I would just put them in a dark, cool space. And because if I put the daffodils in the refrigerator, they might get all the cold treatment they think they needed. And then when I put them in the ground, they would try to grow. Uh, so I don't want them to do that. I need them to stay dormant through the winter. Uh, so only the ones that need additional cold treatment would be the ones that I would put in the refrigerator. So again, that would be tulips and hyacinths for me in Raleigh. Uh, you wouldn't even have to do that in the north uh, where you get enough cold uh, in the ground through the winter. So. Um, uh, I, I, most, most of you just put them in a cool, dark place until you're ready to put them in the ground. Somebody asked about mulch glue uh, for gravel. So there's, there's things called mulch glue and bark binder that you can spray on your mulch to keep it from washing down a bank or a hill or that kind of thing. They're supposed to be natural products, supposed to be safe for dogs and all kinds of stuff. I have no idea. Uh, but I do know that these products exist and you can also use them for pea gravel. This person was asking about using it for pea gravel and I've seen lots of uh, applications where these mulch glues have been used in pea gravel and it seems to work fantastic. Again, I don't know what's in these products. I have no idea. I have no idea to speak to the safety of something for 10 years or 20 years down the road, um, but they do seem to work extremely well uh, on holding pea gravel together and keeping you from tracking it all over the place and kicking it out into your beds that kind of thing. Uh, somebody asked about transplanting. A, um, they have a remontant um, hydrangea, meaning that it will bloom on old and new wood. Uh, they want to know about moving it. Uh, so they want to root prune it. So that would be what they do right now. They just go around the outside of it, cut the roots uh, you know, out of around the drip line, just preparing to move it later. I highly recommend this strategy if you're moving something in the late winter that you go out there now and kind of root prune it. Uh, so that's a great technique. And then they wanted to prune it and then dig it up in the spring. So I would prune it right before you move it if you feel like you're going to need to prune it. It's a remontant 
big leaf hydrangea. So it should still bloom next year, uh, even though you're cutting it back. Normally you wouldn't want to be cutting back big leaf hydrangeas in the winter time because that, they already have the flower buds on them that they would have had. So you'd lose the flowers for the year. But if it is a remontant one, a repeat blooming one, then absolutely you could cut it back pretty hard, move it in the late winter, and it, you should still get some flowers by midsummer on one of those varieties. So yes, your plan is good. Root prune it. Right before you move it, you can prune it pretty hard. You can transplant it in the late winter, and, and uh, there you go. Uh, so somebody, um, I'll put, so somebody asked me, I said, there are some slightly less aggressive Solomon seals, uh, or, you know, uh, variegated Solomon seal for your garden. I'll put the name of one, uh, right here on the, uh, on the screen that, uh, some of the ones with more variegation in them are just less aggressive in the garden, but the regular variegated Solomon seal, oh my gosh, you know, you got to build retaining walls for it basically to keep it, to keep it in place. Let's see, somebody asked about mushroom compost. Just what is mushroom compost, first of all, and then a couple other, uh, a, a follow-up question. So mushroom compost is just the material that mushroom farmers used uh, to grow their mushroom in. I think people think mushroom compost must be all mushrooms <laughs> composted up, but it's not. It's actually the hay and wood products that were used to produce the mushrooms in. Uh, and then that material is composted, and that material is composted for probably 30 days at a temperature that's, you know, 150, 160 degrees, something like that, to kill any pathogens that would be in it. So that's what you're actually buying is the hay or wood or whatever it was that was used by that mushroom grower to grow their mushrooms in uh, after they, you know, after they harvest their mushrooms. So that, that's actually what it is. Uh, and then somebody asked, is there a difference between it and plain old compost? Certainly there's some sort of differences in the, whatever nutrients got used up by those mushrooms in the process of growing those mushrooms uh, versus the nutrients that would be in composted cow manure or composted leaves or composted. Certainly there's going to be some nutrient differences in all of these composts based on what it was that was composted down uh, as to how much phosphorus or potassium or nitrogen or calcium or magnesium or whatever's in it. Okay, so there's definitely some differences, su subtle differences in those kinds of things. But I think overall, I just wouldn't put that much thought into it. I think any organic material you're adding, any compost that you're adding is going to be food for microorganisms to you know, feed your plants with. So I'm not gonna overthink it a whole lot. I do like to rotate products. I've said this many times in the history of the channel. I like to rotate products. So if I'm using mushroom compost one year uh, and I want compost the next year, I might use the soil cube compost that I've, I've, I've shown off if you're in the Southeast. Um, I think I have it linked down below the video where you can buy it in a big bag. And that's leaf compost and grass clipping. Uh, leaves and grass clippings uh, with some sand component mixed in uh, or, then, or switch to cow manure or something else that's labeled compost or my municipal waste uh, product if there's if you're living in an area where you can get compost from your uh, landfill uh, rotate those things so that you're not dumping the same thing I get these questions a lot of questions about can I dump this or that out in the garden yes the answer is likely yes, but just spread it out far and wide so you're not ever concentrating the same thing in the same spot. Same thing with these compost. You rotate different types of materials that you're using so that you're not, if one of these things is high in something, you're not going to go, you know, end up with way too much of that nutrient over doing this for 20 years. Um, so j just keep that in mind. Just rotate stuff. A couple more here. Somebody was at their garden center in Alabama looking at a forever goldie arborvita and they saw that it had been grown in Oregon. Is that going to have some negative impact uh, on them down in Alabama? As long as that plant, you know, that forever goldie uh, arborvita should hold up great for you. As long as it's a plant that will grow in your area, I'm not concerned that it was grown in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of conifers are grown in the Pacific Northwest uh, and you guys will see that in some video content coming up. It's an incredible, you know, what percentage of conifers. They have a very narrow temperature range in some of those areas out on the, out on the uh, west coast, and it really helps to grow pretty much all conifers. You don't have to grow all conifers there. We can grow lots of junipers. That forever goldie arborvita could definitely be grown in North Alabama without any problem. Um, 
cryptomeria. I grew lots of conifers at my nursery in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's really the super specialized ones that need to be produced uh, in Oregon. A lot of the weeping, interesting, slow growing uh, conifers, you know, grafted. They have a lot of, you know, specialists there that, you know, do, do, do grafting uh, for conifers and that kind of thing and, and Japanese maples and really high-end plants are grown there. There was really no reason to grow the Forever Goldie Arborvita there and ship it to Alabama, because again, it could have been grown there, but it's not also not gonna have any negative impact on you uh, for, for, buying it, uh, for buying it from there either. So don't, 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 don't worry about it. Trust me, there are plants in your garden that were grown in Oregon. Uh, they're definitely, if you have a lot of plants in your garden, some of them were grown in Oregon. Almost 100% chance of that. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of nurseries up there. Okay, and then last question for this week. In last week's video, here I am in Linda Vodder's garden in Oklahoma City, uh, and I, uh, we were, let me see, we were at uh, Jenny and Jerry's at Creekside uh, a week and a half ago or so, uh, but last week's uh, Q&A I shot at Tom Sawyer uh, RV Park on, in West Memphis on the other side of the Mississippi River, and that was the question, was that Tom Sawyer RV park? Yes, it is. It's a great RV park that's literally, you camp directly on the Mississippi River. The river was really low, though. Somebody said the river's really narrow there. I think the river's kind of narrow everywhere right now. It just hasn't been a lot of rain. I've crossed a lot of the rivers over the last few weeks that feed you know, the Mississippi. It's incredible how, how much water we're actually missing right now uh, from, from, the, from that river system. Thank you guys so much for, again, for participating in these videos and asking such great questions uh, every week. There's, again, there's, I didn't pick any of the ones from Sunday's Q&A video, so I may go through those and see uh, if there's enough to make another video that you guys will see later in the week. Thanks for following along.